search point or initial vertex. Uh, I think it took me two more iterations to get to the optimal. Um, and I can I can list those. Um, but again, I think I'm hoping that by now you 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 sort of um, understood how to pick the entering variable. I think I've heard something that you still have a trouble with the exiting variable. Um, so once you pick for the next step the entering and the exiting variable, then it's just a matter of I mean you can use you could use um, you know you could even use you could even even design your own code that would say well um, like MATLAB has a, a way of you know taking this matrix and doing re row reduced actual form of course you have to swap the the columns before you can do that but um, uh, so it would take sort of the work from you but um, you'll be able to move to the next vertex and the next vertex. The idea is that at some point, because you only have finitely many vertices, you will no longer be able to you know, decrease that um, uh, that objective function, or in this case, I think this, this is going to increase because it's the opposite. Um, of that we're trying to maximize something. So um, after finally many steps, what you you're going to have to stop somewhere, and stopping means that this um, indicator column, I mean row, at the bottom will have positive components. And then the number there is going to show the um, the maximum. So uh, let me just list the um, the next one. Well, I'll, I'll list you the, the other two tableaus, um, but since I have to restart this, I don't know why. Um, let me let me um, uh, show you in MATLAB how you can run these things. Of course, you know, assuming you have the optimization toolbox. So, if you kind of uh, remotely um, log in to the, uh, you know, I gave you that um, server name. Or if you go in the, one of the labs, I think even 136 uh, has optimization toolbox, as well as 233. Those, those are two labs in the engineering building that have MATLAB. Um, that you'll be able to run these things. And um, let's see. So let me see if I have the history here. I can just. Well, I can start. I can start it all over again. Um, so let's say we still, we start fresh. Um, you just open MATLAB. You've never used it. Uh, what do you do? Um, well, so MATLAB has the command uh, for linear programming, which is L I N P R O G. Okay. Of course, you try to run it like this, you know, and of course there's going to be error. It, it asks for some things, um, and it asks, it asks for some arguments. Now, I'm trying to make this a little bit bigger so I can catch it on the video. Okay, so. <clears throat> You can always hit help, help, lean program, and you're going to get a bunch of, you know, a lot of um, 
explanations. It gives you sort of the syntax that is um, expected. But the main thing is that it actually is um, not in standard form, but it's in what we call canonical form, which, which is to minimize, well, is to minimize the, uh, the cost function. Now, f prime times x, here, the prime stands for the transpose. So it's going to expect you to put the coefficients of the objective function as a column rather than as a row. But that's the only difference. So you can think about this as a c subject to this inequality constraint. Okay? But it actually also allows you to input equality constraints. So for instance, if you have no inequality constraints, you would put this uh, empty. I mean, you have to put it, but I'll show you in a second how to put it empty, empty. And then equality metrics of the co co constraints and the right-hand side. Okay? And you can do a combination of those. Um, and of course, if you have greater than or equal to, you'd have to input the ones with the opposite sign. Okay? Uh, even, you know, you can do this, and of course, then you wouldn't have any constraints on the x's, on the, on the, on the variables. But you can actually specify lower bounds. LB stands for lower bounds. And if they're zero, you have to specify them as being zero. Or upper bounds. You could have upper bounds, right? Which normally would, you could, uh, upper bounds could enter in the actual constraints. You know, but it would be a, it would increase the size of the matrix quite quite a lot. So you could you, you could have this. Now, what I'm showing you here is a very optimized way of implementation of implementing linear programming. So it's, you know, it's uh, it may not be the best, but it is. So that's why you have all this kind of flexibility. And finally, there is one more, which we're going to be using. Oh, you can actually even specify the initial search point if, if you know it. Um, and finally, there are some options. Now, these options are important. The options will actually tell the computer which algorithm to use, whether it's simplex or other algorithms. So there are, there are several ones that MATLAB has already implemented, but we're going to use this um, simplex, and I'll show you another one as well. Um, okay, and that's all. And of course, this, those are the uh, those were the inputs, and the outputs can be simply, you know, showing you what the optimal solution is or the optimal vertex. But you can also list the optimal solution and the value of of the objective function. You can list other things, and we're going to be using some of those as well. Um, in fact. There is a, there is a um, code that I sh that I uh, ah, I don't want to do that. I want to just open a browser. Luckily, this is pretty fast. I just want to open a browser. Where's the browser? Oh, here's the browser. Uh, if you go to the course website. Okay, so this, this is what you got. <sighs> Damn. Okay. Okay, I'll just do it by hand, and I'll, I'll, I'll fix that link. I'm sorry. I, I thought I, I fixed it last time. Nobody um, complained. So, what is that? Apparently, if you start it and you don't use it, you lose it. Um, okay, let's. So leave some space for the um, showing you that thing. 
and okay um, well anyway so once you have that you can open it up here and you can work with it as, as, as with any files um, you can just use the command line I'm going to do that just to show you that it's possible um, I'm going to clear the okay and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to input this matrix A, this matrix, uh, this uh, right hand side B. So uh, for for our problem five, it was four two two negative two. Now this one, let's do this. We uh, not in the standard form, not with equality constraints, but with well, let's do it with equality constraints first since we do that. Um, with equality constraints, it was another 1 and 0, right? For the slack. Now, if you put this with a space, basically you're making a row to make a column. Uh, to make a, the next row, you put this um, semicolon here. I mean, this is really not the optimal way to do it but you know you can type it in a, to be fast and that's the matrix hit enter and you've inputted the matrix A okay what's the matrix B I mean the matrix the um, column B gotta be careful make sure that it's a column and it's not and so forth right that's B and these are, I should have been a little bit more careful. These are equality constraints, right? So right now when I do linprog, um, oh, I need F as well, F. What was F? We're, we're minimizing, so we want F to be the one that corresponds to minimization. That's important, actually, because when you type, you know, unless you type, you type negative F. Right. That's what I do. Okay, lin prog F. And now. The first, the next uh, input is, is asking for inequality constraints, which we don't have. So you just put it like an empty here. And of course, the right hand side of inequality constraints is empty because we're already in standard form, okay? And now it's just A and B. And I should have named this A EQ and B EQ, but. And if we stop here, it's, uh, we, we're getting a problem because we don't set us, we don't ask for the lower bounds. So we have to ask for the lower bounds as well, right? So if I just do it here, what do you think is going to happen? Hmm? Which comma? Well, if you just close parentheses, you're gonna, it's going to tell you. Oh, but it's not, not, not the error you're thinking. Yeah, F has to have zeros. Yeah. So I have to have six uh, coefficients. That's one thing. And of course, the other one is now I don't think it's going to give you an error, but what's going to happen is going to have, it's going to try to optimize that uh, objective function over over this negative infinity infinity, and it's going to be it talks. It gives you an error saying, uh, it gives you a huge, you know, a huge value. So that pretty much is is saying that it's uh, <coughs> it's not a it's not a, a correct. It didn't finish. It didn't finish. It stopped, and it says something with a dual, and I. I 
um, because I didn't give you a lower bound. So I need to put lower bounds. And lower bounds can be, um, it has to be like also a column. So one way to say zeros, you know, I have you know, on a six rows and one column. So that basically would mean zero. Or you can type, you know, zero, zero. Same thing, right? You know, and now, now you can you can add this. And now something happened. The optimization terminated, it said, and you got these numbers. Okay. Now, by default, <coughs> Linprog doesn't use a simplex as a default algorithm. I mean, simplex was the, like historically the first algorithm, but it's not the most uh, used. Okay. Hmm? Right. So this particular one uses what's called a large-scale algorithm, which involves um, the dual problem as well as the primal problem. So I'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk about that. Um, but if we really want the uh, simplex, if we want to force the simplex, then you have to do the following: optim set, and all of this is, excuse me, um, options. You have to define what the options are. Optim set. All of this is in that uh, 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 sample code that I I will fix the link of. And you, what you have to say is a large scale is to be off, and simplex has to be on. Okay, and again, that's it. I mean, you'll just copy it. Well, every time you don't want to see the output, you just put a semicolon so you don't have to see what's, what comes up. Um, and now you go back and you say, this, I'm going to put options, which is, which is what I defined earlier. But this is going to be an error because... To get to options, there are there are two more um, uh, place, two more inputs that the MATLAB was expecting, and that was the upper bounds, which we don't have, so I'm just going to put empty, and it was the initial search point, which again we don't give, and we put empty. So, so this is kind of awkward, you know, blank things, but uh, that's it, and. We run it again, optimization terminated, and it gave us a different numbers. So what's what's up with that? <clears throat> well, first of all, it's hard to check anything. Whether one or the other is correct or wrong, right? It's pretty much you just trust <laughs> that when it says optimization terminated, that it, it terminated and it gave you an optimal solution. Well, let's see. Um, one thing to kind of make your life a little bit easier is to say, let's look at not only at the optimal solution, but also the value of the opti of the uh, and it gives this number, 48, with negative, which negative you have to discard because of that. Uh, we're maximizing, so minimizing, put a negative in front. So we got the value to be 48, which through the simplex method is what they, you know, say it's the optimal, is the max, uh, maximum value of the objective function. If you want to switch back, I guess you can switch back by just not not passing the options, right? So just like this. Then if you do x f val, you get the same value, right? So I mean, what's the most likely explanation? Hmm? There's more than one solution. There happen to be two vertices out there uh, at the edge of the of the simplex 
on which the objective function reaches the maximum value. Okay? That's per perfectly possible. Even in 3D, you know, this is not 3D, but, well, it is, isn't it? We started with 3D. But it's not, okay, it's 3D. So uh, it's a simplex, but it's not in the first octant. Okay? But nevertheless, the objective function was also sort of three components. I mean, it was, it was a, I mean, the level sets was a plane. So basically sliding that plane, you know, until it kind of tan in a, is tangent to the simplex, what this shows is that there are two points, at least two points of contact, meaning that there's a whole edge of the simplex. But what you've done here, you've defined new variables. You have x1, x2, y1, y2, and then your slack variables. And x3 is the difference of y1 and y2. And True. Well, that's 7. Just That's like seven, correct. So X3 is I see. So in 3D, it's 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 the same point. I think so. That's right. That's right. But but in 6D, it's is there are two different points. Yeah, that's what I. Thanks for. Correct. No, so I'm, I I take it back. So, but it is very possible, and I I, I don't I, I think I have an example, actually the one that I posted there. Um, where again, you know, you only have strict inequalities, uh, inequality constraints, and um, it's already in the first octant, so there's no, no, this kind of thing. But still, the two algorithms give two different uh, things, okay? Two different, uh, uh, and that's, that's the case when you have that uh, whole edge that is parallel to the, to the uh, level sets of the objective function. Okay, yeah, but here, here it's easy, easier than that. Uh, remember, this is y1, this is y2. So minus 7 is the x3, optimal x3. Okay? Now, um, Let's say we don't even want to talk about equality constraints because we had no equality constraints. So what if we just want to talk about the, for the raw problem as we had it before? Of course, we still have to do the, um, the split of the positive and negative for the x3. But we don't have the slack variables, right? So if we do this, and what was the other? I'm just lazy. I think this was the matrix. So this is x1, x2, y1, y2. But now we have, and now it's important to change the sign of the inequality. It was greater than or equal than, we want to make it less than or equal to. B is the same, so I'm just going to, I think we don't have to change that, right? But now these are not equality, but these are inequality constraints. And of course, we still have um, lower bound, but only four of them. And now, what what do we need to do? We need to just list those. And I'm not sure. Let's just. Hmm? I think we might need to put empty sets. Let's let's see what happens. Yeah. So every you cannot just bypass those. Hold on. No, F, F, I didn't, I didn't change F, sorry. I should have changed F. Okay. So, I mean, again, this is just um, the flexibility that you have in using equality constraints, standard form or not. Yeah. This one? Yeah. So, I should have, you know, in the, so this is, this is another way of doing without going through the standard form. Can we, can we change it so that there's only three variables, like the initial problem says, and then just change our lower bound so that the x3 has a negative infinity lower bound? I don't know how to input that. Negative i and f. So oh, yeah? Have you done that? Did it 
like this and then lower bounds of course F has to change right INF? Hmm. That'd be great. Uh, and then just, just this, though? No? No. Yes. Yeah. I see. So if, if you only have a partial restriction on, on some of the variables to be positive, you can do that. And when you don't have a restriction, you just put negative INF, which I didn't know. Um, Let's see, with the simplexes, I, I think it should be the same with the simplex. Is this with three variables here? Two variables, yeah. I just gave the lower bound zero and didn't specify it. No, we didn't specify upper bounds. Well, I did specify lower bounds for three. I just gave it two for the first two. How? Zero, semicolon zero. So it must yeah, assume that they're negative. Right. Like, uh, yeah. like this? Yeah, no bounds. Like this? Yeah, that's what I think. Okay. It just assumes if you don't have anything that's negative. Right. I guess it's just you have to order them so that the last ones are not. Yeah, the order is important. Though. Yeah. Right. Okay. Anyway, so you have you have all of this. What you don't have is you don't get the inside of this, right? You just get the optimal value, and you know, um, okay. You don't get the path. Yeah, but I mean, most of the time you don't care. I mean, of course, the problem with this is is you don't have a I don't have I don't have a good feel of you know is this really the correct answer or you know how do I check there's no I don't think there's any way to do it okay so um, let me go back to So from now on, I mean, you know, my preference is, you know, if I have this tool available to just always do it, check, you know, if I have to do something differently, I always check it this way, you know, check. If you have another tool like Excel was, you know, you can use that, you know, check, or just do that as 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 the main of the uh, problem. So, so we're not kind of trying to restrict this usage of the tools, whatever they are, you know, and there's a huge list of linear programming uh, algorithms. But um, understanding what's behind this is, is, is what we're after. And um, let's see, if you let me, I'll, I'll, f I'll finish this uh, tableaus, the last, the two ones that I said it takes. Um, offline. I'll, I'll finish it and post it. So you can always print these things, right? Um, I don't want to take the time here to. Um, let's see. So before we move forward, what I'd like to uh, 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 to clarify is one one last thing is. What I said last time, so let me ask you this. Do, do you now have a pretty good idea of why or how the search is being, or how this simplex method is being performed? Of course, I, I mean, I know the, the suggestion was, was to just to do a kind of a, a one in the plane uh, with, with three or four constraints and um, um, and doing parallel the simplex tableau and see how the, the points are being assigned um, and um, 
by, by each change of the tableau. Um, and I just sort of, I just don't have the time to kind of to do it. I'd like to, um, I mean, I think it's a great idea. I think you should you should try to do it um, offline, or, you know, on your on your own. Um, we can we can do it. Um, you know, if, if 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 any of you has you know has this, um, if you have a trouble with it, just 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 you know do it in my office hours or at other times, or um, or I could even put put it up like a handout. Um, but um, I feel I feel like we we got to get moving um, just from the from the two dimensional cases. Um, Okay, just a, just uh, as I said, a quick um, oh, this is this is really incredible. If I don't use it for five minutes, it's, it kind of doesn't let me type again. This doesn't happen in the spring, so. Okay, so um, I just want to um, clarify one from from last lecture. One thing that we said that um, um, that for the standard form we have um, minimize c x under this restriction that ax equals b x is positive uh, is always achieved at an extremal point for the feasible set It should be the other way around. So it's a set of all positive component or zero component of this, you know, um, set of solutions of this linear system of equations, system of linear equations. Um, and n minus m components of x vanish. I mean, that was, to me, that's the key of this, all this simplex method. Because it, this allowed us to say what? Every time we do our search, we set n minus m variables to be zero. We ignore n minus m columns. We just pick the, the remaining m, okay, and n and m were the size of this metric. So where a was m by n matrix, and n was much greater than m. Okay, so that 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 was the key. That's the key. I think that's the big discovery. I guess well discovery. Now, why is this? Um, I didn't give any proof last time, and I just want to give you kind of a, uh, an idea. In, in th if you were in 3D, like if n was three-dimensional three space, if you only had three, we're talking about standard form. So <coughs> this equation or this system of equations, let's say, could represent either a plane or a line in 3D, right? Each constraint. Each constraint equation reduces the dimension by one. So, if you had one, if you had only one constraint, so if, if m was one, right? And so you had only one equation, there would be a plane in 3D, right? Now, imagine a plane in 3D 
that um, has something to do with the first octant. Right? If, it, if it has nothing to do with the first octant, this feasible set is, is empty. But if it has an intersection, so if it only cuts the first octant, then what's the signature of that? What's that intersection? It's going to be a triangle, right? And it's, so basically the feasible set is going to be a triangle filled, you know, a filled triangle, right? The inside of the triangle and the edges. Well, what's, what are the external points of that triangle? They're always going to be on the axis. Well, what's, what's the good thing about, what's the um, uh, thing about the axis in 3D? Well, axes in 3D have two components, zero. Okay? So in other words, this statement is exactly that. It says that you cannot cut a plane in, in the first octant, just take the intersection of the plane with the first octant, and get an external point that's not in one, one of the axes. Same with two constraints. If you have two constraints, so you have two planes, you have the intersection of two planes, that's a line. That's a line in 3D. If that line goes through the first octant, you know, in other words, if the feasible set is not empty, then it's going to it's going to be a line, right? It's going to be a line segment, and the ends, which are the external points of that line segment, are going to be on the planes. And what's the special about the planes? There is at least one component that's zero. So it's always going to be kind of matching this this number. Yeah. Now there are some degenerate cases when back to the plane, one, one constraint, a plane intersecting the first octant but going through the origin for instance. Then the origin would be an external point so that triangle goes to the origin, the origin is an external point and the origin everything is zero so it's more than that. So that's why it's saying I should say that at least where at least So, how do you argue with this in general? Well, in general, as I said, the feasible set is um, so AX equals B. x equals b with x positive is part of um, or is let me put it like this is uh, a translate of the subspace A x equals zero. It's not really a part. It's, it belongs to a translate. So what do we mean by that? So if b b is usually a non-zero vector, I mean, most of the time. Um, so what's the difference between solving a system that has a homogeneous system and a system that, uh, that's a non-homogeneous system? How do you solve a non-homogeneous system? <coughs> and this, this really is 3D. It's not, it's not a good um, representation because this is what's supposed to be in any dimension. So if you have something like this, AX equals B, right? So I have all solutions of this linear system. And of course, it's going to be only the part that it's in that positive cone. But if you kind of ignore that uh, constraint, just, just all, all linear uh, solution, solutions of this non-homogeneous linear, uh, linear system, then 
how do you find the, those solutions? You find one particular solution, and then the solutions of all, uh, the, all the solutions of the homogeneous system. So in other words, these two, this subspace or this set is sort of parallel to the subspace. Now, what, what do I, why do I call this a subspace and not this subspace? Anybody? Subspace has to have zero vector. In the subspace, you have to have zero vector and you have to have the addition. If you, have, if you had two solutions, the sum should also be a solution. Well, it's true if you have two solutions of the homogeneous equation, but it's not true with this. Right? So this is not really a subspace. But model of translation is just like the subspace. So as far as dimensions are concerned, these have the same dimensions. Okay. So if you recall from the linear algebra um, class, there is there is a so-called dimension theorem. Anybody remembers? A matrix that is n by m, m by n. Uh, m is greater, m is smaller than n. n is the dimension of the kernel of A plus the rank. But well, what's the kernel of A? Is all x that you know you hit them with a, a, and you get zero. So it's basically solutions to the homogeneous system. So if you take all this, this subspace, that's called a kernel. Okay? So the dimension of this kernel, the number of linearly dependent solutions of the homogeneous system, plus the rank, gives you always the dimension of the whole space. Okay. And since we assume the rank to be maximum for our matrix, this is M, this basically means that dimension of the kernel is N minus M. So this set, this feasible set when you have equality constraints, standard form of a LPP, has this, this dimension, meaning, meaning you have this many vectors, linearly dependent vectors you can pick um, that give you solutions of the homogeneous system. Okay. Now, what does it have to do with the with the extremal points of the feasible set? Well, now let's consider an optimal solution for. Um, the LPP basically minimize you know linear functional over this such a feasible region. Okay. What do we do? What do we get? And let's assume that at least m plus 1 components are non-zero. So that's to say that we don't have n minus m zero components. So we, we, we're assumed by a contradiction. Right? So an optimal solution has n components, right? And we're trying to come up to the conclusion that n minus m of them have to be zero. So let's assume that's not the case. Okay? Then 
if you have n plus 1 non-zero components, so, so say x1, x2, x m plus 1 are not 0. Okay? Then, this subspace which I drew, you know, this subspace, this set of homogeneous solutions is of dimension n minus m, as we said, right? Intersect with the span of this Let's call it V1, Vm plus 1. So, this is a subspace of dimension n minus m. That's always the case. Well, A has maximum rank. The other one has dimension m plus 1. The sum of the two exceeds n, right? So the intersection cannot be empty. So it has to be... I'm sorry, what are the V's? Oh, I'm sorry. V's is a standard basis. For, For Rn. Okay. So this cannot be just zero. This has to be some non-zero vectors. You mean Rn or Rn plus 1? N. We're talking about Rn. Rn is our, our biggest space. But you only have m plus 1 vectors. Right. But this, uh, so the standard basis is v1, vn. Oh, OK. So it's just 1, 0, 0, 1, you know, 1, 0, 0, 0, just the axis. OK? Where, where one component is non zero and the others are 0. Anyway, well, all of this is saying is saying that you can pick non-zero vectors. You can basically pick non-zero vectors uh, that are in the kernel. So there is a vector d in the kernel such that um, D vanishes at least where X vanishes. The other way around? I think it's so if we were if we were to kind of come to this to a contradiction basically, you'd be to say that What you'd like to do is you'd like to say, I'm starting from this optimal point, and I use this vector to move in that direction. Right? If you start from a point on this feasible region, and you move in this direction, you stay in the feasible region, depending whether you go positive or negative. So basically, you, did, you say that um, x plus td T positive or negative would actually, you know, one of the one of the uh, directions would would take you out of the feasible set. One of the directions would would, would stay in the feasible set. <coughs> the claim is. Uh, is that
C times D has to be zero, right? What if it's not zero? If it's not zero, then this, th then one of the two directions would actually take you into an increasing cost or, or decreasing cost. And since we know it's, a, it's an optimal, it's a minimum cost, then it's, it's impossible. It's impossible to minimize further. If you have an optimal uh, point, if x is optimal, you multiply by c, you must have c times, times d equal to zero. Zero, that leads to a contradiction? No, 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 not yet. But this this claim is this because um, otherwise you have C times X plus T D would be smaller than C times X for some T, positive or negative. Okay. Now, to finish this up, it would be to say, um, what happens when you, knowing that, that you have, basically you're staying with, ex, with the same, if you go in that direction, you're staying with the same cost, okay, optimal cost. But you still can move and change the, uh, change the, uh, the, uh, the components. And the idea is that you can make at least one more component to be zero. Why can you make one component to be zero? Well, let's say um, x had the first m plus 1 non-zero, right? So d had the, um, the first m plus 1 non-zero. Right? So this means that you can actually use this in going in a direction with t until one additional component of x would actually vanish. Okay? So by choosing uh, an appropriate t, or sliding t if you want, different from zero, one can make an additional uh, component of x plus td to vanish. Okay? You can make one more component to vanish. So you decrease the number of non-zero components. It's like, remember, imagine on this triangle in the, in the first octant. It's like if you have the optimal to be happening somewhere on, not at the extreme point, but on one of the faces, that you could choose that direction, move along the edge of the triangle, until you actually hit one of the axes, and make one more component to be zero. Maybe that would be uh, the idea to. So if you have, if this is the feasible set, and you happen to have an optimal here, then you could say that this is the direction D. <coughs> so this is X.
and you could move in the direction of d until you kind of make another component of x plus td. It's a different x to be 0. So if you have m plus 1, exactly m plus 1 non-zero components, you're able in one step to actually make it m to be non-zero and, and n minus m zero, right? If you have n plus two components that are not zero, then you have to do it in two steps. Once you decrease the number of non-zero components by one, then you decrease the non, uh, number of non-zero components by another one. <coughs> so if that had, say, two faces, then you can move along the edge to that edge. point where you're right there. And then, and then, then go, yeah. To the uh, vertex on the axis. Right. But it would be impossible to draw because they're already in R4. But you could, you could make that move, and you can do it because the dimension of this, of this <coughs> feasible set translated to the origin is exactly n minus m. So you have enough room to move, that's basically it, um, along this n minus m dimension so that you can always move to a, a point where you have more vanishing uh, components. You can do this un until you, you know, until you kind of have that m plus 1 and n minus m, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, add up to more than the dimension of the whole space n. Okay? So that's the key. It's kind of, it's, it's it's kind of a strange way to think about it, but that's the key. I think that that is the key of the simplex method. And that's that's probably the, the one thing that that uh, nobody really talks about. You know, when you first see the simplex method, it's like why do you set those variables to be zero? I mean, who lets you? Why, why do you have that freedom? Okay. Well, it's all because of the geometry. You know the you know number of linearly dependent uh, solutions and all that. That's where the linear algebra comes in the picture. <coughs> okay, um, I've posted the homework for, and I let it for next Monday. Since Friday is the thirteenth, um, so the homework is already posted on the website. I'm not going to uh, give it to you. There's one problem that's uh, only for graduate students. Um, there's problem 14, which talks about a lot of, um, um, uh, well, there's actually four LPPs problems. But what I'd like you to do is use MATLAB. Um, so you don't have to design your own code. but. Just use that simple command. Hopefully, you'll kind of understand. I'll post it, that that, that um, sample code as well. Um, and and your task would simply be to run this using um, the two algorithms. So one is the large scale, and one is the simplex. <coughs> I haven't told you how the large scale works. I mean, honestly, I don't know either. I know it's based on the dual problem. And on Friday, we'll talk about the duality. So we'll talk about the duality pr uh, problem. And we'll, we'll also talk a little bit about integer programming, which um, some of you have, you know, may see in the future. I mean, it's, it's a very practical question of how do you optimize when, you all, when your variables can only take integer values. But um, um, I think you can already start working on those, you know, just I mean, just get it out of your way, um, and at the same time, get used to this, um, you know, black box where you just put in stuff and you see the optimal solutions. Um, and again, I think one problem is for graduate students only. Uh, it's marked with a star. Um, and I think there's a problem with duality, so you have to wait for, till Friday. Um, I mean, feel free to read ahead. I mean, feel free to use. Um, whatever resources you find um, useful. I mean, this is not uh, certainly the only kind of way to, to 
talk about simplex method. I mean, as I said, you can spend a whole semester do doing this. Um, I'm hoping that we can touch enough of the theory so that you're, you feel a little bit better than what you've, you've seen before. I mean, if you've never seen simplex method, this may seem a little bit overwhelming, but uh, I think with a combination of the tools, where the black box tool tools, where you just get the answer and a little bit of this hands-on thing, hopefully is going to complement each other. Okay. And again, always let me know any question, you know, any kind of suggestions. Um, you know, as I said, I'm, I really am constrained by the time in class time, and I'm. I'm hoping you know you don't take it that you know. I think all all, all things are great. Every single you know aspect of, uh, of like what you ask in class is very important, and um, I'll try to you know allocate enough time for that. But I think some 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 you have to do it on your own at home and um, yeah. All right. Well, enjoy the time. Yes.